Good afternoon. So happy to have you here and to learn about one of my favorite creatures, the orchard mason bee. Today's class is a 10-minute university presentation offered in collaboration with and in support of the Oregon State University Extension Service Master Gardener Program. There are some things I really want you to have as takeaways today. I want you to learn to identify mason bees in several forms, understand the difference between mason bees and honey bees and how they work so very differently, learn how to attract mason bees to your home, know the life cycle of the mason bees, how to keep your bees healthy, and become an air b and b super host. The orchard mason bee, the scientific name is Osmia lignaria, is also known as the blue orchard bee or the bob. They, uh, the picture up here on the right is a picture of a male, um, I'm going to call him Bob because he's a male, uh, mason bee, and you will notice that he has very, very fuzzy, fuzzy face. And that's one way to tell the difference between the male mason bees and the female mason bees. The other thing is the size. These were uh, two bees taken side, same time. They were side by side. I just split them apart so you could see the size difference better. This is the male and this is the female. The male also has longer antenna. They're very, very gentle bees. They, males don't sting. They don't have any stinger at all. A female can, if you really irritate her, sting you with her ovipositor, but it's more like a mosquito bite. It doesn't have the venom that a, that a honeybee has. They're only active from mid-March to mid-May. They're native to North America, and we have a lot of them right here in, in Oregon. They're solitary. There's no queen. Each bee takes care of her own uh, progeny, and they don't have a hive. This is the horn-faced bee. Uh, it's Japanese import Osmia cornifrons. These were imported to pollinate the apple orchards in New England, and they've made their way across the country. So they're not native, but you're going to see them a lot. When I first uh, got my mason bees, um, I bought the business. The very first bee that hatched was one of these, and I had no idea about the, the horn-faced bees. And I called the guy that I bought it from and said, what is this? And so then I started learning about um, horn-faced bees as well. They do share sites with the local bobs, but they do not share holes. So they just, they kind of work side by side. They're here in the Willamette Valley and they're pretty prolific, prolific. Now let's take a look at the difference between a mason bee and a honey bee. Mason bee on the left, honey bee on the right. Here are some of the major differences in how they work. When you talk about bees, people always picture honeybees. And so this is just a whole different ball of, huh, ball of wax. Uh, honeybees, they're originally from Europe, so they're not native to the United States. They colonize with a caste system and a queen. So there's one queen per hive and everybody else has a job to do. They fly more than a mile to gather pollen. They can, I mean, they don't have to, but they will file one mile, two miles away to gather the pollen that they want. Beekeepers need full protective gear to work with them because they sting. They carefully strip the pollen from flowers. And they're kind of high maintenance, as you can see from all the gear that they're doing to work with the bees. They can lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. That's why the honeybee hives are just swar swarming with bees. Mason bees, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to pun you to death here. Blue orchard bees are native to North America. They're solitary and they have no hive structure and they have no queen. They only travel 300 feet 
from their nesting sites. You don't have to wear any protective clothing when you are around them. And they work longer hours and in colder temperatures than honeybees. Mason bees will start working between 50 and 55 degrees. Um, so these kind of cold um, spring days, they're out there working and they get up early in the morning and they work till late at night. They, as I said, they rarely sting and a female will lay only 30 to 40 eggs in her short lifetime. Now, because of the way they're structured and the way they work, mason bees are so much more efficient and pollinating than honeybees are. So seven mason bees can do the work of 350 to 700 honeybees. And that's what it was, it would, uh, seven mason bees could pollinate this whole tree it would take 350 to 700 to poll honeybees to pollinate that tree. So why? Why are they so good at pollinating? The honeybees, when they go to gather pollen, they mix the pollen with the nectar to carry it back to the hive. And they store the pollen in these baskets. So you've got a little pollen, a little nectar, and so it doesn't really, uh, transfer from blossom to blossom as well as as it, with a with a honey a mason bee sorry um, they will travel up to two miles to find the food store so once they find a food store they kind of zero in on that and this is what i'm doing and don't mess with me they are very particular um, they are effective pollinators because of the sheer numbers the two thousand eggs a day um, there's just when you've got a hive there's a lot of bees there Mason bees are messy homebodies. They, uh, when they go on, land on a flower, they don't land precisely and pick the nectar and pick the pollen and put it in the basket. They belly flop. They just <laughs> right into the middle of the flower. And they don't mix the pollen and the nectar. So the pollen is very dry and transfers from blossom to blossom easily. They only travel about 300 feet from the nest. So that's the size of a football field. And they're effective pollinators because of their structure. They stay in the local area. They visit many blossoms within their area. So it doesn't take as many because they're just focusing on this local area. They're very much more efficient when they're actually pollinating. And they, they're they kind of omnivorous in terms of they it doesn't kind of matter which which flowers are there they'll they'll go for everything they have they don't have pollen baskets they have what's called scopa which is specialized hairs on the abdomen for gathering pollen and you can see it really good here on the left so their whole body is just one big pollen gathering thing the hair the pollen sticks to all the hairs and then here's a mason bee headed into her tube. Look at that little pollen, but she's just got so much there. She's going to take that and make a pollen ball for her, for her egg. Mason bees and fruit trees. Let's focus on apples. Mason bees are just terrific pollinators of apples, pears, almonds. They work really, really well. Since, um, let's, but let's focus on the apples. When apple blossoms bloom, they have one king flower, and you can see in the picture here. And that is the flower that, when pollinated, is going to produce the biggest, best apple. And so when your apple trees are getting ready to bloom, you want to have your mason bees out and about and working so that they're ready to go when that, when that king flower blooms. And so you don't want to wait until the apple trees are blooming but right about now as you can see we've got lots and lots of flowers um, out fruit trees organ grapes all kinds of things for them to eat so get that that system going so that when the apple tree apples happen the excuse me apple blossoms open up they're ready to go and ready to start pollinating so here's a year in the life of a mason bee and we're going to start in March because that's kind of when the whole process begins. 
So here is, they emerge from their nest in early spring, and here is a little, this is a male orchard bee, and you can tell because you can see this, he's got this little mustache down here, emerging from the cocoon. They mate, and then the males die. And the females will store the male's sperm to use when she chooses in a organ in her body. So once she's got, she has, she has the male sperm, she starts gathering pollen and um, making a nest. So the first thing she'll do in a tube is do, uh, even if the tube is closed off, she'll do a mud wall. And then she gathers pollen, she makes a pollen ball, lays her egg, and then blocks that off with mud. And then she does the whole thing over and over again. In a six inch tube, a, male, a female mason bee will lay seven to eight eggs usually. Uh, the Japanese horn-faced bee have much smaller cocoons and they will lay up to 13 to 14 per, per nesting tube. The female eggs, female eggs are laid in the back of the tube, and this is for, for both the horn-faced bees and the blue orchard bees. The female eggs are laid in the back of the tube, and they're fertilized by the sperm held in storage. And then toward the front of the tube, the unfertilized eggs are male eggs, and they're the ones that are going to hatch first. So the female will usually lay about, the female uh, orchard bee will lay about three female eggs and then four male eggs. The eggs will hatch in a few days and they become the larva. And the larva feed for about 10 days. And then they start spinning a cocoon. And here's the life cycle of, so the larva spin a cocoon and then they, eventually form into this. The, the first form of the bee is white and then they turn black and then they become, they're fully uh, uh, adult. So from April to September, the developing pupae are very fragile. And so the nesting material should be handled very gently. You don't wanna, if you've got your mason bee tubes, you don't wanna be moving them around. Um, oh, this is full, let me take that and move that away that disorients the females and um, can also dislodge the eggs from the pollen ball. And then that won't be a successful, successful cocoon of breeding. I'm gonna go back to this for just a second. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. In June is the only time that you wanna start, you wanna be able to to move the nesting material. And that's because you're gonna protect it from uh, wasps, parasitic wasps. And when you do that, you move it, but you do it very, very gently. So here is just a whole bunch of mason bees and they're dormant in the cocoon until February or March when they're ready to come out again. So they're just hanging out, hibernating kind of like. Mason bee nesting habits. They like, in nature, they like hollow reeds. They like natural cavities, holes that are made by birds or other insects. But they will use any appropriately sized hole they can find. Here's one in some T111 siding. This is an electrical plug at my daughter's house and they made, they laid eggs in there. Now, if the female bee just has small uh, lengths to lay her eggs, she will lay male eggs, not female eggs. The only time she'll lay female eggs is when she's got plenty of room to do the female eggs and then put the males in front. So they will lay eggs in all of these weird places, but they will all be male eggs that they're laying. Okay. Now you've seen the basics of how mason bees work. Here are some guidelines to becoming a mason bee, Airbnb super host. And I really like this quote from the David Suzuki Foundation. 
If you choose to attract mason bees to a bee home in your wild bee sanctuary or your yard, take responsibility for increasing the likelihood of healthy bees emerging in spring. Why host mason bees? Native bee populations are challenged by increased use of pesticides, herbicides, and decreased uh, uh, sources of shelter and food. They're important in preserving the diversity of pollinators. And here's the really interesting thing I've just learned that the survival rate for bees in the wild is 30%. The survival rate for well-hosted native bees is 90%. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this video here. This is obviously a very thriving group of mason bees, but it is not the best system that we could use. And this is my yard. This is uh, last year in the vegetable garden. And you can see all of the uh, column mason bee condos I have. And we've learned that packing the, this many together helps to spread parasites, chalk brood um, diseases. It's just, it's like people in too crowded a space where it's really easy to transmit pathogens and bad things. We've all learned a lot about that uh, this past couple of years. Now these are two emergent tubes and you see the, the kind of goldy brown stuff here. These are scent markers that uh, the male bee will put out so that kind of like, okay, this is my space. So just leave that. And the male bees will, at the first, they will come in and out of those tubes quite frequently. Number one, if the weather gets cold, they'll go back in the emergent tube and just kind of hang out till things get warmer. They also keep going back in to check to see if there's any females ready for having fun. Okay, super host amenities, be our guest. Prepare guest friendly accommodations. You want a cozy space, you want a shelter from weather, and put it facing south or southeast and three to six feet from the ground. You want a quiet bedroom. The emergent container should be dark with only one hole that is light and that kind of guides them easily to find the place where they can get out. Clean bedding, so important with quality sheets. So you want fresh, clean nesting materials. There's several different kinds but it's our job to keep it keep things clean and tidy. Here are some mason bee nest boxes that um, really work well. This one is um, again one of mine, and so you've got all the all of the prerequisites of two inches of shelter covering it so that the it doesn't get wet. Um, we got an emergent house and we've got a laminate block in there. This is a very simple one just done with a PVC tube. You can see they've got the emergent box up here. These little ones are made by a local master gardener. Uh, Debbie Wood makes these and these again just have the the tubes in them and then these are wood drilled with holes and then instead of putting the paper tubes in a cardboard box, um, sorry, a cardboard tube, they're just put in the holes. And this is another good system um, where you can pull the tubes out, clean them, take care of them, but just have the wood, the, the wood um, holes drilled. Okay. Here's some avail commercially available mason bee nests. I think this one right here is absolutely gorgeous and it's just so not good for mason bees. Look, there's no protection. It's all reeds. And so that's gonna make it really hard to get the, get the bees out to take care of, sanitize, clean them. It's really pretty. I'd hang it in my house in a minute, but I wouldn't let my bees in it. Here's another really cute one. Again, not much overhang, but one of the main uh, things that's wrong about this is that it's hanging so that any wind or a bird landing on it is gonna shake it and it's gonna swing. 
And again, that's really easy to have the egg get knocked off from the pollen ball and then you've got an unsuccessful bee. Again, just no overhang, not easily cleaned. This is one from my house when I first got into mason bees and I saw this at Costco and I thought, oh, this is so cute. You know, one of those cute Costco ones. After a few years, this is what it looked like. It's just a breeding ground for mold, mites, and chalk brood. And uh, so this is what they're cute here. This is what they look like after a few years. So pretty, but not Airbnb worthy. And here's some nesting materials that are really good. These are two, uh, we call them laminate blocks. And you'll see all of this um, dark, they've taken and they burned it with a little bit um, like a torch. And the reason for that is that it gives the female mason bees a really good sight line of, okay, this is where my nest is supposed to be. Makes it easier for them to find the nest, uh, their particular hole. This line here helps uh, keep, when you're stacking the trays back up again, it gives a, this, this tray goes here, this tray goes here. It kind of like one, two, three, four, five, you just keep that lined up. And this is uh, Lynn County Master Gardeners sell these bee blocks and they're just the best I've ever seen. I love them. Um, they're held together. They've got um, a bolt through there. Oops, sorry. They've got a bolt that keeps it tight and closed. They used to have sell it with a wood backing, but now they recommend a foil tape, which is a tape that you use to, for duct work easily available at any home improvement store. Um, so these are easy to take apart and put back together again. After a while, these bands tend to get loose and break. And so you've got to figure out some other way to, to keep those blocks together. If the blocks are not tight, they're going to have parasit parasites getting in. Right now, this year, I'm trying zip ties to hold my blocks together. I will part back next year. So these can be easily uh, cleaned. They can be used after year after year, they're harvest, but they must be maintained, cleaned and sanitized, clamped or weighted to prevent warping, and held together during the active phase, bands, zip ties, etc. If there's any cracks in there, the female mason bee finds it necessary. I've seen where she will line not only the front and back of the cell, but she'll line the fill in the cracks with mud. And uh, so that's just more work for her. Here's more nesting materials. Uh, one of my favorites is the cardboard tube with the uh, white paper straw. I like to get mine pre-split. You can also pre-split your own with a letter opener. Um, this is what they look like when they're ready to harvest. It just opens right up and the, the cocoons come out, the cocoons and whatever else is in there. Um, they're only used once, so it's not, you don't have to clean them. Uh, the pre-split straws are easier and the, the cardboard outer tubes can be used year after year. But you must purchase new liners every year. And here are just some reeds, also a really good natural nesting material, but it's much harder to get the Get the cocoons out, you have to split them open. Um, and we have a video that we did of cleaning your mason bees, how to take care of them through the Master Gardener website. We did this last fall and it shows how to split the, split the reeds open. Emergent containers. This is one that's provided um, lots of places, just PVC. Uh, I like to drill holes, little tiny holes in a little bit because this is kind of airtight and we just want more, more air going through. These are all ones that I have used and made at my house. This is a business card box. This is a slide box, a medicine bottle, and this is a cardboard chipping tube. All of these work great. The only thing you need to do is put uh, a hole three-eighths to a half inch, one hole, 
so that they can come, the bees can go out. And this kind of mimics what they're used to in nature. So like when they hatch, they see they've got a hole there to go to. And that's, they're, they're going for the light, head toward the light. I will tell you a quick story. Last year I had, um, I was, it was getting late in the year and I really needed to get my bees out. And so I used a neighbor down the street and had to walk down the, walk down a hill. It was quite steep. And he was out in a natural area and I took my bee box out and I put it out. And then I went back the next day to check it. And when I had opened up the box to line up the holes, they hadn't quite lined up. So I had all of these bees that had hatched over during the day and overnight and they couldn't get out. And I walked toward the, toward the box and I could just hear, Bzzz. oh, they were, they were not happy. So I opened it up, let them out and then lined up the holes and then it worked much better. So be careful of that. If you're using something, a system like that, make sure that the holes are lined up and they can get out. This is a beautiful emergence box made by, it was a beautiful emergence box made by an Eagle Scout for Lusher Farms. And it got left out over the summer and over the winter. And this is what happened to it. Um, this it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you can see a wasp has made a nest in here. I'm gonna try and clean this up, get the mold off and stuff. I don't know if I can get it cleaned up to where it's usable again but uh gonna give it a try but so again this is part of maintaining what you've got a lot of the nests the emergent tubes are you know kind of throwaways they're not very expensive when you've got something beautiful like this take care of it clean it and um, it should last for years all right to be an airbnb host we've gone over the bedding and the bedroom and now we need to provide snacks so they need something flowers with pot flowers with pollen about 300 feet of their nest and when i say flowers i'm also including things like uh, big leaf maple willow those have flowers they're not showy you don't really see them but it's an important food source for for native bees fruit tree blossoms they love composite flowers open petals Dandelions. Oh, it's so painful to leave my dandelions every year, but I'm doing it now because the bees love them. Um, they'll get pollen from any flower. They really love um, blueberries, the Pieris andromeda, these kind of, um, it looks really kind of like a closed little bubble, but they manage to get, get pollen from them. They also need mud and within 20 to 30 feet of the nesting area. And it should be more clay than silt or sand. Fortunately, where we live, that's really not a problem. Uh, make sure that you've moved the mulch so that bees can reach the native soil. And if you don't have a nice damp area, create your own. And this is something like I had to do what I was telling you with my neighbor who lived down the hill in the natural area. It was where I put the bees there. It was kind of warm and dry and there really wasn't any mud. So I filled up a liter bottle, poked a little holes in it, filled up a pan with some clay and then put it in and just let it trickle out. And then I had to go every couple of days and refill my liter bottle with the holes in it so that I had a constant source of mud there. If there isn't any mud around, the bees will leave and find someplace else to nest. So if you want them to stay and work at your house and give you lots of great apples, pears, cherries, and flowers, give them mud. And if you're very lucky, you will have a helper to prepare your mud source for you. And this is my pup Barkley, and when I'm digging, he loves to dig too. So it's just handy to have that. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little fair warning. Sometimes in the nightly news, I say, okay, we're going to show you things that might disturb you. So look away. That's the portion of the program we're on right now. We're going to talk about the nasty things that can attack mason bees. <clears throat> 
Okay, these are mites. These are Crombian mites, also known as hairy-footed mites. They do not eat the bees. They don't kill them necessarily, but what they do is they will just cover a bee so that it gets, they get so heavy they can't fly. And so look at this poor bee just, just covered with mites. And they're, again, they, they get brought in, they're on, they're on the flowers and everything, and they got, get brought in when the queen is, or I'm sorry, when the female is laying her eggs. And so they just kind of take over a pollen ball and they eat all the pollen before the egg has a chance to get to it. This is a chalcid wasp. We call it the mono. And they're really good at getting even through those thick cardboard tubes and they will lay their eggs in the in the eggs egg cell and then they they breed and the eggs don't the mason bee eggs don't have a chance look at this ovipositor they just go right through and into the into the um emerging when they oops sorry the mono wasps start in june and so the eggs are already pupating and they go into the cocoon and lay their lay their eggs. The Houdini fly, this is a new one and it's, it's quite dangerous. It's a kleptoparasite. It doesn't, you know, eat the mason bees at all, but it steals all of the provisions. So these are tiny, about eight one hundredth of an inch, just like a fruit fly. They've got large red eyes. Um, they found in the past few years in Washington state and recently found in the Portland area. They lay eggs in the chamber with the females preparing her eggs. So they just kind of hang out outside um, of the nesting block or the tubes. And when the female leaves, they sneak in, lay their eggs, go back out again. The eggs hatch before the, uh, mason bee eggs so they eat all the pollen and leaving the bat, the mason bee larvae to starve and this is what they look like the the larvae are quite sticky and when you open up your cocoons in the fall you'll find that they escape from the nest by inflating its head to break through the mud plug they're so small that they don't have the strength to break through the mud plug so they expand their head back and forth to break the mud and uh, in the chat section, there should be a link to a video that shows this. Again, uh, kind of a source of nightmares for me watching this thing do it, but um, it's fascinating. This is chalk root. And when I first started with maize and bees, it's a chalk root. I said, well, what's chalk root? Well, it looks like this round black C-shaped thing. And I, I, so now I'm going to educate you about chalk brood. Chalk brood is a fungus and it's on flowers. It's all over everywhere, it's microscopic. And it gets on the bees and they bring it into the nest. So when the bee makes her pollen ball, the fungus will be in the pollen ball. And then the larvae eat the pollen ball and the fungus is ingested in them and it kills them so then it just takes over everything and it kills them and what's left is this mummified larva and inside it's just a mass of um chalk brood spores they're very fragile so when they're broken it's like a powder bomb and it just spreads it everywhere so when you find these you remove them very very carefully and um, sanitize, throw them away, sanitize everything that's touched them as it uh, really spreads quite easily. So how do we keep our bees healthy? A little work two times a year. That is really all it takes. In June, bring your nesting material in carefully by June 1st to minimize parasitic wasps. And there may still be some mason bees hanging around and still working by June, 
Um, but by that time, if you look closely at the females, they're getting pretty ragged, raggedy looking and tired. And the only thing that they're laying are males. Um, so it's really, you know, you're not doing a terrible thing by just bringing in the nesting material. Again, they will find other places if they feel so compelled to lay their eggs. And you're going to do that again very, very carefully. And then in October to November, this is probably the most intense part, is harvesting and cleaning your cocoons in the fall. So you clean up the pests, the parasites, and diseases, and this keeps your bees healthy and productive. And again, people say, well, that doesn't happen in nature, so why are we doing this? And that's because in nature, you only get a 30% survival rate. And with us helping out, there's a 90% survival rate. So that's what you want to be doing. So store your cocoons in the summer. You can get a mesh bag or even a paper bag, fold it over a couple of times and um, sealed shut. And you can see how I have this where the nest holes are facing up. And that's the way you want to you want to take them out, you want to face the nest holes up and store them that way so that the larva can maintain connection with that pollen ball and the eggs so that everything is just right there. Because if it gets jostled loose, they kind of lose their way and then they they can't do it. They can't find the food that they need. This is the not so pretty part. This is what it looks like when you open up one of those um, laminate blocks. All the ugly things that I've showed you in the previous slides are going to be in there with your cocoons. The mites, the frass, the parasite larvae, the chalk brood. This is black stuff. Well, it looks nasty. Is not. It's just bee poop. It's the frass. Um, it doesn't take long and it's not difficult to clean up. And remember, you're earning your super host status while you're caring for your bees. So you want to remove the cocoons from the blocks. You just use a wooden dowel, angled wooden dowel. I use a pen when I can't find my dowel. Um, P-E-N, not P-I-N. And gently remove the cocoons from the blocks or from the tubes. And as you're removing them, you're going to take the cocoons and put them to the side and leave the nasty stuff, the mites and the chalk root and that kind of thing. So you're separating the good stuff out from the bag while you're doing this. Then you're going to clean it with a bleach solution. Two tablespoons of bleach to a gallon of water if you're using a brand name. Four tablespoons of bleach if you're using an off-brand kind of thing. And that removes the mud, the frass, and the mites. And your water is going to get really dirty. There's a lot of mud in, involved in this. So when you're cleaning, the water is going to get really, really dirty. But all the nasty stuff is going to kind of float down to the bottom. I try and work with, a, with the bees inside a strainer so that when I'm done with the original cleaning part, I can just lift it up and put that in uh, fresh water and rinse them off really, really carefully. So this is a bunch of... Uh, cocoons before they were cleaned and this is what they look like afterward much nicer and people say well doesn't that hurt them aren't you know aren't they delicate and they're really not they're quite tough uh, the outer layer is made of silk um, but it's it's built to withstand some not I'm not gonna say rough handling but the kind of thing that we're doing here we're swishing them around in water really doesn't hurt them at all and then you need to dry them very, very carefully. You can do it on a paper towel. Um, I use a window screen and I blow air on them because I store a lot of bees. So it's important that everything's really dry. It's a little easier to dry a smaller amount like this. And then you're going to keep them cool from October to March. You're going to put them in a little box with a little... Uh, little uh, on paper towels with a little bit of uh, moist paper towel and a little cap so that you've got a little bit of humidity today's refrigerators are, are pretty dry 
and then the vegetable section in the fridge is a really good place to store them. Cocoons after cleaning. So this is some cocoons that have just been cleaned and it's easier to tell the orchard mason bees from the Japanese horn face bees when the cocoons are wet. The wet ones, the orchard bees, um, the blue orchard mason bees have this kind of brown bronzy kind of looking thing. They're a little bit fuzzier and they're bigger. And then these over here are the Japanese uh, horn face bees. They have smaller silvery cocoons. But when you look at them all together, dry, it's really hard to tell them apart if you're interested. Okay, so you, now you've learned how to take care of mason bees and you have to decide, is this something that I want to do? And I think it's really fun and I encourage people to do it all the time. But I want to make sure that you understand that if you're going to host these bees that you're going to take the time to take care of them and not have them die of disease or parasites. So if you don't have cocoons right now, get some. And you know they're pretty prolific and a lot of people will be willing to share their cocoons with you. I started just by some lady that I met mentioning that she had mason bees and I said oh I've always wanted to do that so she gave me 13 cocoons and that's how I started with mason bees like five six years ago um, you can also purchase them locally try and purchase them locally if you can because um, again that keeps diseases and parasites from being transported from other places if you already have cocoons you can go back through the list of all the things that you need, you know, the box, the nesting materials, the emergent tube, all the things, three things. Um, take your clean cocoons out of storage, set out your nest boxes and nesting material within 300 feet of a food source, provide mud near the nest, and place the cocoons in an emergent box next to the nesting material, and watch the fun begin. That's really all it takes. Um, 10 Minute University will be making a video, it should be up in a week or two, about how to place your bees, mason bees, out in the springtime. Show you what kind of things you need, where to put them. Should be pretty informative, so keep an eye out open for that. Here are some of the resources, and I want to do a shout out to um, Rent Mason Bees and Crown Bees, they provided a lot of great, uh, some of those great photos. And then um, our own Oregon State University has some really wonderful things about Mason Bees and how they work and what, what to do. So just really good stuff. If you have any questions, contact www.cmastergardeners.org. 10 minute university videos, handouts, future classes, and you can ask questions. Well, I am a big Mason Bee fan. And every time I hear you talk, you always interject something new for me to learn. So thanks so much, Leah. Well, you know, I always learn. I learn something new every year. Every Mason Bee person I talk to, I've been doing this for five years. I raised 34,000 cocoons this year. And I'm still, there's still so much to learn. It's just, it's a fascinating subject and I just love being around them. Well, I love them too. They hang out on my upper deck. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm waiting, I'm waiting anxiously. It's so funny, had... I, I want to interject something here because I was out at your deck last week and Priscilla does not have flowers anywhere. And she has a great Mason Bee activity on her deck but what she does have is a lot of big leaf maples and i think some willows too so it and cottonwoods i'm not sure how they feel about cottonwoods but they i think they'll they'll take anything they can get <laughs> but yeah. so it's you know you don't have to go out and buy necessarily plants but look around and see what you have and um it always helps of course to have things like oregon grape and pieris and that kind of thing but um Things that are blooming when the mason bees are around. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
So um, there have been some really good questions. A lot of them have to do with once the mason bees are established in your yard, taking care of them best. So the first question has to do with um, the different types of tubes and straws. One person mentioned, oh, you can make them out of newspaper. Some person said, can you use drinking straws? Another person says, what is a split straw? Another one wanted to know what is a straw and what is a tube? So <laughs> there's some technical issues That's here that really I would love good to clarify. Questions. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start off with the first no. Drinking straws, absolutely not, because they're plastic and they don't breathe. And so you're going to get mold. It's, it's just, it's going to kill, it's going to suffocate the bee. So no drinking straws. If you want to do um, newspapers, you can. Um, it seems like a lot of work when the, the tubes or the, the straws are pretty cheap. And here's the thing, as I was researching this talk this year and, you know, bee blocks, straws, reeds, holes drilled in logs. And over the years, it's like every couple of years, it's like, this is the only way to do it. This is, you have, absolutely have to do it this way. And, and um, they all work as long as you take care of how you're doing it. So I'm gonna start with the wood blocks, which is the most natural um, way that they find it in the wild. So you can drill holes in wood blocks, but if you don't get them six inches long, you're not gonna get enough um, depth to do the queens as well as the males. And then the research I was doing was saying, so if you can use wood blocks, that's great. You can just use the blocks or you could insert one of those white liners in it and take those out. But if you don't have a liner, use your wood block for a year or two at the most and then get rid of it and start fresh again. So that way you're not keeping, because you can't clean that out. So you're not keeping those pathogens and you know, all that kind of thing. Um, the parasites and the chalk brood and blah. Um, a split tube. Okay, so you can buy white, just plain white tubes that are made from mason bees and they're just rolled so they don't have, um, they're just a tube, like a straw. And when you take the mason bees out, when it's time to harvest the cocoons, you can kind of take a little, make a little cut, and then you unwrap them kind of like a biscuit can, which is great if you only have a few. Like I said, I have considerably more than a few. So I like the split tubes where they come, you can either buy them pre-split, which is more expensive, or a trick I learned this year is to get a, a letter opener with a little razor blade in it and just slit the tube like that so that it's easier when you're taking it out. You just kind of run your pan or your, or your wood dowel down the tube and it opens up and the, and the, the cocoons come out. Uh, the reeds, that's again a natural product. To get it out, you kind of have to break open the reed and take out the tubes, the, the cocoons, cocoons, sorry. Um, but again, that's a one year thing. Do not just, I do not recommend leaving the cocoons in the reeds and just letting nature take its course. You can do that, but you're going to have a much less uh, viable mason bee community. Okay. And if they're Googling that, say to purchase online, they are just Googling mason bee paper. Mason bee nesting materials, mason bee supplies. Okay. I think um, that's going to answer we, a lot of questions that we got. We have um, several stores in the area that also sell them if you don't want to, you know, Google them online. Oh, I think I've seen them out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, another bunch of questions came from um, people once the nest has been 
filled and they see all those little mud plugs at the end of their straws. Mm -hmm. Um, where do you take them? So are they going into your garage? Are they then being refrigerated? Um, what are the steps you take to keep them safe? Until I ever ask those questions. Yeah. Thank you so much because I forgot to talk about that. So in June, okay, rewind. When you've got your mason bees and it's say like the middle of April and all of your tubes are filled, there's mud plugs everywhere, leave them there and you can add another block or, or more tubes so that you can keep the process going, but just right. leave them all there. So you can just keep adding if, if everything is full and that happens quickly sometimes. Um, and then in June, first of June, that's, that's my date. You take all of those filled nesting materials, you turn them so that the mud plugs are facing up and you put them in a mesh bag or paper bags, roll that over, seal it up, so that you're keeping parasitic wasps off away. And then you put them in your garage or in a shed, someplace dry, but someplace that's gonna still be warm. Now, last year with the heat dome, I had mine up at the top of the shed in a loft area. It was in the shade, so I wasn't too worried, but that if my shed had been in the sun, I would have taken them down and put them down lower um, because I just didn't want fried bees. Um, mm. so, so a temperature range? Uh, if it starts getting over 100, you know, and, and they're, they're close to the ceiling that's getting beaten by the sun, just move them down a little and protect them. And that's just me pulling a number out of the top of my head, but that's what I would do. Okay. Okay, so um, this was an interesting question. Someone needs pollinators in their greenhouse. I don't know how big the greenhouse is, but would it be kind and useful to release mason bees in a greenhouse? Okay, I'm gonna put a pin in that and go back to the question before because I forgot to talk about what to do with them in the fall. Oh, sorry. Yep. Nope. That's my fault. I was going, oh, wait a minute. I forgot the last <laughs> time. I can just sense the frustration coming from some people. So after you harvest the cocoons, you take them and you put them in a container. And our, um, if you look at the video that we did for last fall, what to do with your mason bees in the falls, it goes over all of that. That's available at 10 Minute University. Um, but you take them and you put them in the refrigerator. You want to keep them cold all winter long and you don't want to, if if they're out and about in the real world you know we get some days that are up in the 50s and 60s and then it gets really really you know it freezes again and what that does is it it increases their metabolism when they get warm and then they go back down into hibernation so they're losing a lot of the stores that they need to survive well and so when they finally hatch, it's like they're depleted already. If you keep them cold, they've got all of the energy that they need to go forward. And so you keep them in the refrigerator from October till it's time to take them out again, which is about now. And again, that container needs to be breathable, right? So right. like right. You, I know you've used um, an oatmeal container, a uh, cardboard oatmeal, oatmeal container. <laughs> I've used a shoe box. My husband doesn't go near it in the refrigerator. <laughs> I made um, one today out of a Parmesan cheese uh, plastic thing, like a yogurt. It was almost like a yogurt thing. But I put um, paper towels at the bottom and then I drilled holes in the top so that there's air flowing through there. So, yes, in a breathable container. Okay. A um, couple more questions that I really think that people are interested in is what happens when you see spiders entering the tubes before the, um, the mason bees have a chance? Is that something you need to intervene on? I've never, I heard this have question never before. seen that. 
and I don't think I'd intervene, frankly. Um, you got me stumped. Yeah. You got me stumped. I've never seen it. I will go, I'm going to go one further though here and say, so um, wasps, paper nest wasps and all will, will tend to want to sometimes make a, a nests inside. So you've got your blocks and you've got the spare space and all of a sudden you've got wasp nests in there. If you take and you put um, crumpled up newspaper, um, more tubes, kind of fill up those spaces and that will discourage wasps. Okay. Spiders, you yeah. got me. Yeah. Okay, back to the the um, greenhouse question. Oh, Is yeah, it kind right. and useful to release uh, mason bee uh, cocoons and uh, nests in a greenhouse? I have a greenhouse and I used to work for a greenhouse company. And I don't think I would recommend that. Um, most of the stuff that is in the greenhouse, you're growing. If you're growing vegetables in the greenhouse, you get something that is easy to do in the greenhouse that self pollinates. Um, I. Th yeah. Where's the mud, you know? Um, yeah. Well, could they use the could they use the mason bees? Let's just say they're not really interested in propagating mason bees, but they want to have perhaps they have some sort of tree that needs yeah. pollinating. And you know, is okay. tender and needs to be in a in a in a greenhouse. I know that they they breed bumblebees and move bumblebees around to some of these massive greenhouses and do that. So that would work. Um, uh, it's, it, it actually has become a problem with bumblebees moving like, from Canada into, into um, greenhouses, big greenhouses in the United States and all because they, they're bringing disease. So, um, but they do use bees in greenhouses. Um, if you've got a greenhouse and I would, and they need a pollinator and they need a pollinator go for it and see how it works i think i'd leave leave the door open so that they can get in and out oh um you know and this time of year you you kind of want the yeah i get i get i get orchard bees in my greenhouse all the time and I take them out and I, cause they can't find their way out. You know, they're always up against the windows. Yeah, I'm I just, trying to get out. I'm trying to get out. And so, yeah. Yeah. I, I and, think it's an interesting try. Yeah. I think that would be an interesting try. And I'd love that uh, viewer to uh, get back to us and see. Yeah. Let us but, know. But I, I get your point about the propagating it. That might not be the ideal situation <laughs> for uh, propagating. Um, how about this person needs uh, pollinators for their apple and cherry trees, and those trees are not quite in bloom. Can you help me understand how much bloom do I want before I pull the the um, the uh, cocoons out of hibernation? You know, put them in the emergent box. Okay, so you want to start your bees in their yearly process. You want to pull them out of the refrigerator and get them going before the apple, pear, cherry trees are actually in bloom. They're going to last, the bees are going to last until June. So they're out there working. And then when, you're, when your flowers come in bloom, they're ready to go. They're already on the job. And so they're just, oh, more stuff. Let's go. Um, so now is a great time you, you know there's a lot of stuff in bloom right now already the apples and pears not so much quite yet but they're getting ready so i would get things going right now actually i have gotten things going right now there's okay. plenty of source pollen sources for them right now okay and some people have started with mason bees like you did getting the bamboo um, tubes and now they've seen the light they know that there's a better and more efficient way to do it how do they make that transition because 
one person was concerned that they were going to be going back into the the home that they were familiar with. So how do we um, ease them into the new Airbnb? (laughs) That's a great question. And that's something I just found the answer to uh, this year. So let's say you have one of those no, no um, multi-insect bee boxes, bee houses, hotels, and you want to get them out of there. So what you do this year is you put them in a box, cover it up, give them an emergent hole. So just that oh. one hole, they can get out and then you take the box after they're out, take the box and destroy it. Isn't that clever? I thought, yes. I was wondering the same thing. Well, what do I do with this? You know, there's things in there. So yeah, put it in a, put it in a cardboard box, one hole so they can get out. And then, you know, after a few weeks, go ahead and destroy it. I resembled that remark and yeah. I was too <laughs> sad to then get rid of it. I took it over to our community garden so that those bees could continue over there. Well, we are at the end of our hour, believe it or not. Um, You've answered so many of our questions. Um, I'm just so excited, uh, you know. It's going to be a great year. There's so much information out. Yeah, it's going to be a great Mason Bee year. Yeah, and and just to intervene, these bees really are very gentle, and some people are worried about bringing um, bees into their into their yard. And, um, you know, I really encourage you to, uh, to help the mason bees. We have habitat areas vanishing in our, as our, you know, our Clackamas County, you know, gets more and more homes. So we, we need to help these bees out. If you have any more questions that we didn't get answered, feel free to go to the Clackamas County Master Gardeners website. And we have clinicians there. We have a lot of people that know a lot about mason bees and they will be happy to answer your questions. Okay. Well, Leah, I love working with you. I thank Sean for doing an absolutely awesome you, job uh, in, the, in the chat box with lots of great links. Uh, you can check that out. And uh, we'll be back next week. And our topic next week... Our topic next week is the best trees for home gardens. So be sure to register for that so you get your link. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll be back next Wednesday with our noontime chat. Thank you, Priscilla. All right. Bye, folks.